Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here in this uh, wonderful space uh, for this uh, conversation. My name is Eric Liu. Uh, I am an author and uh, founder of an organization called Citizen University. Uh, and I'm going to be serving as our moderator today. Uh, one of our panelists, Mickey Edwards, uh, uh, wasn't able to, uh, to be with us. Uh, and uh, we're going to channel Mickey the best we can here. Uh, uh, and I wanted just to uh, uh, first quickly introduce uh, uh, our uh, really fantastic uh, panelists here and then frame up the issue a bit. Uh, we're going to begin a conversation on this theme of uh, imagining or reimagining citizenship. Uh, and then we really want to allot uh, a good chunk of time here uh, for a conversation uh, throughout the room here. Uh, and, uh, and I really do emphasize that. Uh, Q&A, if you do have questions, but conversation uh, is very much in the spirit of what we're, what we're talking about here. Um, so let me just introduce uh, 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 sequentially here. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Heather Smith, a uh, dear friend and collaborator who is the president of Rock the Vote. Um, many of you know Rock the Vote uh, began uh, uh, over 20 years ago um, uh, uh, in affiliation with MTV and works today to organize and mobilize young people of the millennial generation uh, not only to vote but to engage in civic uh, activity uh, across the board and become more civically uh, aware and educated. Uh, um, and we'll talk a lot more about what Rock the Vote does. Uh, to, um, uh, only in this, uh, in this context, to Heather's left, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, our, our friend Mark Meckler. Uh, Mark, um, known to many of you because he's been to Aspen before, um, was one of the co-founders of the Tea Party Patriots when the Tea Party movement first came uh, to fruition. Uh, left the Tea Party uh, Patriots uh, as an organization uh, and since uh, founded his own organization called Citizens for Self-Governance, uh, which is working in very interesting ways and cross-partisan uh, ways to uh, really reinvigorate the sense of uh, 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 actual citizen self-governance. So we'll talk uh, more about that. Uh, next, I'm delighted to have uh, here in our panel, uh, Cristina Jimenez, uh, who is the founding director of United We Dream, uh, and one of the nation's leading voices and activists uh, for comprehensive immigration reform, but also for uh, the community of undocumented Americans, uh, and has just been a champion out there uh, herself as an undocumented uh, member of our community, and uh, I, I believe as we all sat down here, uh, the uh, immigration bill uh, uh, went to floor debate in the United States Senate. So uh, uh, we, we are right on the zeitgeist uh, right here, but we welcome Christina, you and your, your work. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, needing no introduction to anybody who uh, either has ever been to Aspen, uh, has ever listened to the radio, or has ever opened a newspaper, particularly the Washington he Post. He doesn't uh, shut up, is what he's <laughs> saying. <laughs> E.J. Dion uh, of the Washington Post and NPR and uh, the Brookings Institution. Um, we're going to begin, uh, we wanted, I wanted to pose a common question to all four of our panelists and give them uh, a couple of minutes to speak to that, and then we're just going to enter into a more uh, rolling organic uh, conversation. But that, um, the opening question is simply, uh, given this moment that we're in, we're in a remarkable moment, not just because the immigration bill is on the floor and we're in the midst of this debate, but uh, for a variety of reasons. This week's Supreme Court decisions, uh, what's been going on over uh, the debate about the NSA and about government and its relationship to citizens, the IRS scandal, uh, all these things uh, that are forcing us and uh, giving us both opportunity and obligation to reflect on what does it actually mean to be a citizen? Citizenship is a status under law that some people have and some people do not, but it's also a set of norms and ethics and values. It's a way of being and showing up for one another. Uh, it, it's also a set of privileges and immunities, to use the language of the Constitution, a bundle of rights. Right? But we don't talk so much about the ways in which citizenship is also a bundle of responsibilities, uh, and that's a thread and theme that we're going to bring out in this conversation. But in this moment right now where that word, which even you know, five, 10 years ago had kind of a musty 50s, eat your vegetables feel to it, now is hot. It is front and center right now. People are actively worrying and thinking and reckoning with what it means to be a citizen in this moment. And so my first question for all of you to speak to is in this moment, given this time that we're in, how do you define or would you redefine citizenship here in the United States? Uh, Thank you, Eric. Uh, it's a good question, and I'll say we started thinking more and more about this recently in light of the immigration fight and in light of what the dreamers were doing around the country. And, and if we said citizenship, most people in our world thought legal status, right? And we thought, well, wait a minute, it's more than that. And it's really about if you call yourself an American, regardless of your status, if you call this place home, then it's your role and obligation to make this country work for you. 
And as an organizer of young people, 18 to 29 years old, uh, I think we have a real opportunity to redefine what it means right now. Um, I try to get these young people fired up about all sorts of issues and try to get them engaged. But the thing that they've been most passionate about over the last handful of years was the Arab Spring. And it was seeing young people like themselves fighting and fighting, losing their lives in many cases to have a democracy that really hit home. And we started to see this incredible like solidarity and people posting things and getting engaged and wanting to do more with our organization as a result. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I think we have young people now realizing that democracy is something that you fight for, this concept of self-rule. But we have to expand that definition further right now to also include that it's something you have to keep working at. Uh, as one of our partners in this work, the Mikva Challenge, likes to say, democracy is not a noun, but in fact it's a verb. And so as we redefine citizenship for young people today, it's not just about participation, it's not about voting, it's not about status, but it's about making this country work for you. That's the same spirit, it sounds like, Mark, that citizens for self-governance uh, you know, are, are really activated by, this idea of self-rule. It is, and uh, you know, I did come out of the Tea Party movement, and that is what drove the Tea Party movement. It was a sense of disconnect from our system of governance. And it, the statistics are different than what folks in the media will tell you about the Tea Party movement. Roughly 27% of members of the Tea Party movement are either Democrats or independents. And so it's over a quarter of people in that movement. And they're not there because they're right-wingers, and they're not there because they're Republicans. They're there because they felt that whoever they voted for However, they participated in democracy by voting. They weren't getting what they voted for. And it seemed, and I can tell you as somebody on the right, though not a Republican, I felt like whoever I voted, I wasn't getting what I voted for. And I travel around the country and I ask a set of questions, whether I'm in front of a progressive audience, a liberal audience, a conservative or a Tea Party audience. I always ask people a similar set of questions and I get the same answer. Questions like, who in the room voted for continuing $1 trillion deficits? You guys can go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, see, I haven't found that person in America yet. And so that begs the question, if you're not voting for it, if I'm not voting for it, if none of us are voting for it, then why are our representatives continuing to do it? And that shows a disconnect between the citizen and the government. And what we see is the closer that government gets to the citizen, the greater the connection. You know, uh, congressional approval ratings are at an all-time low right now. It's amazing they keep going lower, and you think they can't get any lower. But if you look at local government, on average, approval ratings for local government, city and county government, runs 60% plus. And so what that shows is when people feel like they can actually engage with their governance system, self-govern and participate, that they're pretty satisfied with the results. So for us, uh, sort of redefining citizenship means defining it down. It's not voting for your congressman. It's being engaged in governance at the local level. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how some of that very local problem solving on issues like criminal justice, for instance, allow you to build very unlikely right-left alliances uh, and, and coalitions. But Christina, for you, your work is nothing but, in a sense, redefining citizenship. What, what does this uh, mean to you? Exactly, thanks for having us here. Um, I'm very happy to be here representing immigrant youth and dreamers in this conversation. And I think that for us, we're actually doing that. And we have been doing that for the past decade of organizing and sharing our stories as someone who is an immigrant and who grew up undocumented in New York City, you know, we are defining, redefining citizenship and expanding the concept of citizenship because it's beyond the place where you were born. You know, I was born in Ecuador, so I'm an Ecuadorian citizen, but all of the values that I embrace are the values that I learned here mm -hmm. in America. And I see myself as an American, and I don't have, you know, a, a paper that says I'm an American citizen. Um, and many of the dreamers don't either. But what we have really done is we are exercising citizenship by being engaged, by fighting for our rights, by holding politicians accountable, even though we don't have the right to vote. And so it really comes down to, I think, a responsibility of contributing uh, and a, a responsibility for the common good of not only immigrant communities, but the rest of our community in America. And I think it's about understanding that citizenship is beyond just having the right to vote, right? It's about engagement. It's about being part of the, the political process. And what you have seen with DREAMers is that, you know, it doesn't matter if we don't get to elect our Congress members or our senators. We have gone to their offices and say, 
I am your constituent, and this is my story, and this is why you should care about immigration reform. Um, and so I think for us, we're re we have been redefining the issue of citizenship and what citizenship means to us, and we believe ourselves as Americans, although we don't have a paper to show that we are, and we were not born in this country. Um, and as we think of the impact of immigra a potential immigration reform, I think that we get into more um, interesting um, you know, uh, thinking about how we will continue to redefine citizenship in the well, US. Th th this question right now, EJ, is, <coughs> is front and center. As we debate in the context of immigration reform, this idea of a pathway to citizenship. We spend a lot of time talking about that pathway, how long it should be, what you, know, what you need to do to get on that pathway. Uh, but we haven't talked so much about the destination itself, right? About citizenship itself and what it takes to reinvigorate that. Th those of you who might have been here earlier this week, EJ was part uh, uh, of a thing that happened here called the Franklin Project, uh, an initiative that grew out of last year's Ideas Festival, uh, pr promoting an idea of national service, trying to spark uh, a national movement around national service. And EJ, for you, this question of citizenship, maybe it's not about redefining, but just simply returning uh, to, to an older sense of citizenship. Right, we were talking about that. By the way, just for the record, I actually did vote to add a trillion dollars to the deficit <laughs> because I think if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't have entered, ended an economic downturn well, where no, everyone no, had lost their purchasing <laughs> power. So, and I'm, I, wish, I, I wish, wish we had done it, but we're not here to argue about deficit, although I'd be happy to. Um, let me just, um, you know, you asked an interesting question that may, and what you talked to us about it before. Um, you know, what is citizenship? And to me, it's to share in the joys and burdens of self-government and to understand the obligation to balance your own legitimate interests with the common good. And that is what democratic citizenship or what citizenship in a democratic republic uh, is all about. And my favorite quote on this, quotation on this actually comes from the philosopher Mike Sandel, who many of you are familiar with. And uh, Mike once said, when politics goes well, we can know a good in common that we cannot know alone. Uh, and I think that really speaks to the idea of citizenship as a concept of things we do together and not simply things we do uh, on our own, even when they are creative and uh, productive things. And I, the other quotation I wanted to share because I want to put on the table the question, are we making it harder for people to be good citizens. Hmm. And in that uh, famous new nationalism speech that uh, President Obama likes to quote that uh, Teddy Roosevelt gave in Osawatomie, uh, Kansas, uh, he said the following. He said, no man can be a good citizen, and now he would say men and women, uh, unless he has a wage more than sufficient to cover the bare costs of living and hours of labor short enough so that after his day's work is done, he will have time and energy to bear his share in the management of the community to help in carrying the general uh, load. And he went on to say, uh, we keep countless men from being good citizens by the conditions of life with which we surround them. And so when we're talking here, we're gonna, you know, we're probably at some point, whenever you talk about citizenship, you sound preachy, and you're always saying, well, people aren't as good as they should be. Well, I would ask, uh, if we want more people to vote, why are we uh, making efforts to make it harder for them to vote with ID laws, <laughs> onerous registration laws? If we want people to serve, why do we not, why do we make it harder for them to serve? There were more than a half million uh, young people who wanted to go into AmeriCorps for 82,000 slots. That's one of the things we talked about at the service summit, and you can multiply that across uh, service opportunities. If we want citizens to be better informed, why do we do such an inadequate job of teaching our kids citizenship and government uh, in, uh, in high school. And I say that as somebody, my kids go, went to a great public high school, they were able to take the AP state local government class. It's a great class. Something like that should be available uh, to all our students. It's useful and uh, it's um, civic. I have a, a long list of if we want people to, but two others. If we want people to engage in the public debate, why do we make it so unattractive? Um, you know, imagine uh, TV ads for commercial products that are like the ones we have in politics. You know, if you buy that guy's burgers, you'll be poisoned. <laughs> if you buy, fly that airline, you'll crash. If you invest with this firm, they'll embezzle your money. That's what we tell people about public life. Uh, politics is the only line of work that advertises against itself 
uh, year after year. Um, and the last thing I'd say, and this is just to provoke you a little bit, um, you know, if we want people to be citizens, which is about something we do together, why do we wrap ourselves in, uh, exclusively in the language of market choice, individual market choice? There is a place for market choice, uh, but the market, market choice is not all of life. And I think the language that we have surrounded ourselves with sometimes operates against citizenship. I, I'm not sure, Mark, that you would even disagree necessarily with the idea that um, when it's market above all else, we lose something in the way that we govern ourselves, the way that we live our lives and community and family. Um, one thing that if I were to connect a dot between what you were saying about the impetus for both the Tea Party and Citizens for Self-Governance and the Teddy Roosevelt speech that EJ was just quoting is, well, part of what Teddy Roosevelt was talking about was inequality. When you have severe structural inequality of the kind that we have today, um, it just becomes, as a simple fact, harder for many more people to engage in civic life. Uh, but the other dimension of inequality, which I think your work speaks to, is the sense that too much, too many of the decisions are being made by a small elite, um, and that the elite in politics, in public life, this is across party, this is across, you know, a region, um, uh, have, in a sense, rigged a game. Right. Oh, I uh, agree. And, that, you know, and to answer the market choice question, I think what's the alternative? And today, the alternative to market choice is choice by a small ruling elite that's mostly disconnected from the rest of the population. I spend very little time in Washington, D.C., and a lot of time in places like Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Grass Valley, California. And what I find is that the people in those places look at the people in Washington like they're aliens and vice versa. And we watch speeches of these people on TV talking about the recession has ended. And my friends sit around and ask, where will I find a job and how will I buy groceries for my children? I go to Washington, D.C. I see more construction cranes in Washington, D.C. than I've ever seen in any city in my life. Lamborghini of North America just put its North American headquarters in there. And the main complaint is too many folks who want to pay cash for Lamborghinis. More lobbyists employed than ever before. Seven of the 10 wealthiest counties in America are in the beltway around Washington, DC. So it's right now, the choice we have is market choice versus choice of people who are enriching themselves at the expense of the rest of us. Yeah, Heather, so much of the, you were, you were describing earlier when we were kind of prepping for this conversation, how there are so many in the millennial generation who, regardless of party, are just, for reasons maybe Mark is describing, just dubious and skeptical of politics as politics, right? Uh, but are still trying to find uh, ways to do essentially politics by other means. What are you seeing happening with the young people you're working with at Rock the Vote? Well, I, I will tell you to kind of build off of EJ's question there, uh, why are we doing all of these things if we don't want people to be good citizens? I think most young people today pretty much believe that those in power really don't want us to be better citizens. And in fact, they're doing a lot of things really well to keep us away from the political system. And they're quite disgusted by the partisan bickering and the uh, distrust of politicians to actually solve the problems that they face every single day. And these are real problems, right? These are students on average graduating with $25,000 worth of debt. And yet we have on Monday the opportunity uh, to double those student loan interest rates and still no action has been taken on that. What kind of faith do you have in your political leaders when they aren't taking action to solve your problems? So what we've seen instead is them turning to themselves. It's not that they don't care anymore, it's that they're trying to find solutions on their own. I heard this great stat the other day that more young people funded themselves through Kickstarter and generated more money for the arts last year than the National Endowment of the Arts gave away. Hmm. That is young people being entrepreneurial and finding solutions to the problems that they face each day. That's free market. That's free market. But I do also fear that that keeps them away from engaging in their government, which in the long run will only make their situation worse. So this goes to Christina. I mean, you know, you embody a fact of American history. American political history is a story in which outsiders come in to remind insiders what the creed was supposed to mean, right? That, that, that's from the beginning, right? Whether you're talking about the Irish arriving in America, you're talking about the civil rights movement, you're talking about today the immigrant rights movement. And for you, this, you know, in order to be coming from the outside into the inside, 
you know that this is not just about sloganeering. You're actually learning the machinery of government. You're learning how policy is made. You're learning about markups of you know, bills and committee and Senate and so forth. So a lot of things that uh, you know, many others in your generation are saying, that's a waste of my time, you're actually doubling down on to get smart on. How do you spread a message, whether to other uh, dreamers or to just you know, uh, native-born American young people, uh, that no, 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 it matters that you understand the rules of the game so that they won't be rigged against you or, or be made without regard to you? Yeah, well, you know, what has worked for us is that we have actually achieved victories yeah. by organizing and taking action and getting engaged. So for us, we can say the reason why you want to get engaged and we want to share our stories as undocumented immigrant youth and, and families um, and we want to get engaged in the political process and you know, like it's been like a whole roller coaster <laughs> to be part of the, the markup in the Judiciary Committee and understanding all of the, the inside game that happens in the Beltway but also understanding the power that we have outside of the Beltway mm. in educating others and empowering young people to do that. And you know, after organizing over 10 years, the immigrant youth movement reached the most significant victory in the immigrant rights movement, which is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program that protects some young people from deportation. And when that happened, young people felt like, oh, wait, I'm not a voter, I'm not a citizen, but sharing my story, coming out, getting engaged, doing all those lobby visits, writing all of those letters, knocking on doors to get out Latino voters in New Mexico, in Florida, in Nevada, all of that worked. I just want to say, this is a discerning audience here, but maybe for some people who are watching us stream live, I just want to explain what we mean when we say dreamer. Uh, these are activists fighting for uh, a bill uh, called the DREAM Act, which would have given young people uh, uh, born here, I mean, not, not born here, who are undocumented here, but were brought here uh, by their families as children, a pathway to citizenship, uh, either through service in the military or going to higher education. And so that, that was the origin of the idea of dreamers. And uh, it was really something that we reclaim because otherwise, you know, media and otherwise, when I was 19, in newspapers, I will be giving interviews about my story and I was cited as the illegal student. Right. I was the illegal, I was the illegal alien. And so for us, we needed to find a, a, a way in which we could really uh, create a shared identity within immigrant youth that I was not going to make you feel like the other mm. and the alien. Mm. Um, so that's why Dreamer came about as the term that we um, use. EJ, um, one of the most formative books I ever read actually in my political life is one of EJ's, I'm not sure if it's your first, first or your earliest book, book uh, Why Americans Hate Politics, which I think was 1991. Yeah. Um, and, and is still as fresh today. Um, I urge you to, to, to get it. And, and one of the reasons why is that EJ was describing um, what he called the politics of false choices, right? Which we still live with today, even more amplified. Uh, and the most basic false choice that you were describing in that book, EJ, uh, was that you know th th that to be American, to be a citizen, is to understand that there are these tensions all the time between federal and state, right? Between uh, individualism and collective action. Uh, between um, you know, what we do uh, in order to kind of be free for ourselves uh, and what we do to plan for the future. And that to actually engage in civic life is to recognize that you can't make a false choice between these things. Do you feel like 20-some you know, years after that book that our political civic culture, when it comes to thinking about not our politicians, just us as citizens, do you think we are worse off or better off in terms of our disposition to think beyond that binary? Well, first, my next book is going to be called Why I Love Eric Liu. It's very <laughs> kind of you to mention that, uh, that book. You've got um, at least one buyer. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> the, um, um, the, I don't think we've gotten a lot better. I, I was hoping we would, but I don't think we've gotten a lot better. I can't resist constantly jumping to Mark's provocations. Um, <laughs> I just want to mention, <laughs> I just want to mention on Market Choice, one of my favorite New York jokes is about a corrupt judge who uh, gets $10,000 from one lawyer to fix the case and $5,000 from the other lawyer. And he has a conference of the two lawyers and says, look, if you give me another five grand, we can actually have this trial on the level. And you know, there are just certain things that we don't want bought and sold. And I think that's a big argument in politics. For example, I don't think you should buy or sell how long somebody lives, which is why I think it's a legit and good thing for government to help people buy health insurance if they can't afford it. You don't want people to starve if they couldn't save enough, which is why we have Social Security and so on. So I think we all, in our guts, know there are limits to markets. And 
I, I just wanted to put that in. But the, um, this false choice concept, I mean, the, the last book I wrote was called Our Divided Political Heart, and it was very much about the false choice between liberty uh, and community. Um, and I think to understand us as people, going right back to the founding, um, you have to understand that we have always valued individualism and liberty. There I would have no argument with Mark at all. But we have also believed in and quested after community. And that liberty itself depends upon uh, strong communities. And that uh, that includes actions of government, but it's not limited to government. We didn't see government as apart from uh, community. And, you know, if you believe that public action was only something invented by Woodrow Wilson or the New Deal, then you have to leave out uh, Henry Clay and Abraham Lincoln and Alexander Hamilton and a whole lot of other people uh, in our history who believe that a prosperous, uh, inventive entrepreneurial economy depended on government and other collective forces doing a lot of things to make that possible. Clay, in particular, used to talk about internal improvements, which we now, in a very ugly way, called infrastructure. Uh, you know, he wanted to build the roads and canals that would bind us together and allow us to have commerce. Uh, and uh, this involved doing things collectively that also serve the interests of prosperity and, I believe, in the long run liberty. So I do think that, and, and my, my argument, just to provoke him back, with uh, my, uh, my friends in the Tea Party is that I think they view the founding and they view the Constitution itself um, as almost entirely about individualism and liberty. Uh, and uh, forget, as I always like to say, that the very first word of the Constitution of the United States is we, uh, as in we the people. And so it's a we document, not just an I document. Mark, I, you know, one of the things that uh, strikes me is we've talked about and, and worked together on this project that uh, uh, you've gotten involved in uh, called Living Room Conversations. Right. Um, our friend Joan Blades, who is one of the co-founders of MoveOn.org, uh, and uh, quite uh, you know, progressive uh, uh, organization, um, has created a set of projects uh, called simply Living Room Conversations, in which uh, the format is very simple. Uh, and uh, actually, I want to let you describe it, because you and Joan have participated in some of these, and not with an aim of Kumbaya coming out and you know, magically finding uh, all the ways in which we have uh, found a consensus, uh, but maybe getting to a little bit of what EJ is talking about here, which is recognizing that it's not an either or. There are tensions between uh, liberty and community. There are tensions between a strong state and a free people. Um, and um, can you tell us about what you and Joan have gotten started? Sure. So uh, it's an organization called Living Room Conversations. You guys can find them on the web easy enough. And obviously, a strange bedfellows, so one of the founders of MoveOn.org and one of the founders of the, uh, of the Tea Party movement, what we're working on is teaching people how to talk to each other about the issues facing the nation. If you turn on television, it really doesn't matter. I watch them all. You watch MSNBC or Fox. What you're going to see is how to be divided. What you're going to learn is how to talk at each other and not with each other. And that's what people tend to model their behavior on. So if you're a conservative and you sit down with your liberal friends, you probably are really good at making them angry. <laughs> Pretty quickly, right? And the same is true in the other direction. And we learn those from television and newspaper and all forms of media nowadays. That's what's taught. So what we're trying to teach with Living Room Conversations is how to have those conversations in a civil way. And it starts with humanity. It starts literally the first hour of these conversations, scripted conversations, is about why are you here? What are you passionate about? What do you hope to accomplish out of these conversations? What do you hope for in your own community? I guarantee you, after you finish that first hour, what you think is, well, I like these people. You know, these are my neighbors. These people could be my friends. You go into the room with a sense of trepidation. Oh, I'm going into the room with three liberals, and what will we find? And one of my friends said, they're coming to my house. What do you feed liberals? <laughs> <laughs> Arugula. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, well, poison. <laughs> poison. It's funny, but that's how divided we are. You know, so Joan lives in, in the hills above Berkeley, California. I live in the rural foothills in California. Just to give you the picture of the divide, I drive a huge F-350 dually pickup truck that's lifted and loud and says Tea Party on the tailgate. And when I went to dro drive to Joan's house the first time, the first question I asked her is, do I need to stop at the border and get a Prius expert you know, to drive me in in their Prius? But we sit down and what we find is that we have a lot in common, a lot more in common than you would think. We find that we're concerned about the same things in our communities. 
We find that we don't believe that our schools are operating well. We find that our prison system is appalling and that we believe in fundamental criminal justice system reform. We find that the vast majority of Americans believe the war on drugs is a complete and total failure. It's doing damage to our country generationally, and yet our politicians and the powers that be keep doing the same thing. So what we find is a lot in common, and out of that grow projects we can actually work on together. So Joan and I are working on criminal justice reform as one of the fundamental things right now. Also, crony capitalism is another great one. Nobody, none of us, like the fact that in Washington all this money is trading hands for favored constituencies and the regular citizens are on the outside. Everybody's frustrated by that, except for the people in D.C. who are getting greased by this action. Heather, you know, one of the things when Mark was alluding earlier to you turn on the media and so much of political media teaches us how to be divided, I want to expand the frame actually beyond just like political news media to the larger frame of culture. Right? So much of what Rock the Boat does, for those of you who don't know, is to enlist great makers and voices from popular culture. Celebrities, movie stars, musicians, uh, you know, art makers of all kinds, right? What have you learned over your time at Rock the Boat about the ways in which culture makers can change the culture of citizenship, kind of artistic culture makers mm -hmm. can have this influence? Yeah, it's interesting. What we try to do is take what you're doing one-on-one -on -one right. and actually model that behavior through popular culture to a much larger audience. And I'd say that using celebrities, musicians, artists in our work probably has two different uh, benefits. The first is I go around the country, I speak to rooms filled with young people. Uh, I was telling Eric earlier, it's quite refreshing to look out and not see a face that I'm twice the age of. <laughs> um, and, and when I talk, it's almost like their parents talking, right? I can tell them to go vote. I can tell them why that matters. And they kind of roll their eyes. If I name drop a little bit, oh, well, this morning, for example, I was just having a conversation with we'll give you a real one, Chris Novoselic, who was the bass player in Nirvana. We were talking about the Voting Rights Act, and he was telling me this, and all of a sudden the room kind of perks up, right? And then if I bring an artist into the classroom with me, then it's suddenly voting is the coolest thing that's ever happened, and you know it's the best day of their lives, and I get thank you notes for the next three months about how I've changed their world. Um, and, and it is true, they can grab attention of an audience that's not naturally political, that's not inclined to think about these issues, and get them to not only pay attention, but really change how they think about that question. And that's the bigger thing as well. So instead of just getting their attention, it changes the norm around what it means to vote, what it means to be a citizen. It's like a giant marketing campaign. But then you and do something very powerful with that attention once you have it, right? I mean, it is true. We, we try to change what it means and model this behavior nationally. And I'll give you a really interesting example. So obviously Prop 8 yesterday with uh, gay marriage. Ten years ago, this was not something that was very favorable. Um, but we've been working with artists to talk about the issues. We've been working with um, television shows to write this stuff into their scripts. We've been bringing artists in the classrooms to talk about it. We have musicians writing it into their lyrics. And 10 years later, the, the numbers have flipped. And in fact, uh, as we're passing the Supreme Court thing yesterday, I went back to some HRC statistics, which are eight in 10 Americans right now claim that they know somebody who is gay. When you ask them who that is, the majority list a television character. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's either a hopeful sign or a very yeah, distressing sign. Yeah. <laughs> sure, right. And it changed their opinion. Uh, and then yesterday with the gay marriage thing, the number one most passed around piece of media on the internet was a quote from Macklemore and Ryan in their same love song, which again, it's just the power of culture to influence how people see these issues, and it makes them want to get involved. It, the, the, the other thing that Rock the Vote has been powerful at doing is converting that attention into the, what EJ was alluding to earlier, the actual teaching of the actual skills of being a citizen. You, you, you've created this program called Democracy School, right? The, Democracy the, class, yeah. So um, we decided that you know, we can't bring artists into every classroom, but we can put them on video and we can tell the story their way. Uh, so we have these videos that are about the history of voting and why it matters and power and all of the things that are actually exciting about this. Uh, and we put them together and have the artists do it. We animate it, it's really cool. Uh, teachers can sign up and we get this box in their, and it arrives in their classroom. 
it is the coolest day of the school year for these kids because there's this cool box with all these stamps on it. The teacher tells them to put their pencils away. They put the video in and it's, you know, John Legend and Darren Chris and all these people that they get to see on television talking to them. Uh, they get to stand up and interact and at the end of the day, what they've learned is how our electoral process works why it matters, the power that comes with voting, and, and that they have a real role in it. Uh, and they walk away um, way more engaged and way more likely to participate. So, you know, EJ, just to come full circle, because we spent, when, when you talk about citizenship, when you talk about the future of American democracy, we're talking a lot about this uh, millennial generation. That's a phrase that is used over and over again when we were at the uh, Franklin Project Summit on National Service. Well, the question was, how do we make it possible for a million young people in the United States every year to be engaged in some meaningful, full-time, year-round form uh, of service to community or country, right? Uh, and the thing that strikes me, EJ, is one of the threads of that conversation, which the whole project began here a year ago with General Stanley McChrystal. Some of you may have been present for that. Uh, and, and Stan McChrystal, uh, you know, he speaks a language that sings for me because it is, it is a language of, we have to, in his words, create a culture of responsibility, right? Citizenship not just as what I get to do, or not just as, you know, don't tread on me, but citizenship as what I'm, what I'm supposed to do, my part of things, right? And EJ, you alluded a moment ago to how that thread of conversation can get very preachy, right? Just, just inherently uh, about responsibility, about the obligation side of citizenship. What is your instinct about how we catalyze a meaningful conversation in this country about the responsibilities half of citizenship in a way that doesn't just become, oh gosh, here comes somebody to tell me to eat my vegetables, or oh gosh, you know, somebody scolding me. What's, what's your sense of how we do this? Well, first of all, I think this whole idea of emphasizing the joys of wielding power, I mean, we demean the word politics. Self-government is a remarkable thing. Awesome, right? And that when you, we talk about what is happening in the Senate today, um, the fact that an immigration bill uh, is on the floor of the Senate is the direct result, I believe, of what Latino voters chose to do in large numbers in the last election. And if Latinos had not shifted their vote to send a message to the Republican Party, in particular in this case, but uh, that's the particular example here, uh, I don't think we'd be where we are today. So when somebody says, you know, politics never works, well, that is simply not true. And that the other thing is that we have this, you know, we always, almost always say, well, that's really political. And it's almost always a negative. But what is politics? Politics is the alternative to war. Uh, politics is how we settle differences. We are going to have different interests. We're going to have different sets of values. And we can either try to work out how we're going to live together and what laws we are going to live under, or we start uh, doing serious damage to each other. I salute, by the way, what you're doing with these sessions. And I think part of it is not just discovering that people agree. A lot of times people disagree. But we have really, we don't have real arguments in the country. We have, uh, you know, uh, counter assertions like, you know, <laughs> that guy doesn't understand English, so I'm going to say it louder, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, Christopher Lash, the great historian, said that, you know, the, in real argument, you put your own ideas at risk by entering imaginatively into the ideas of your opponent initially to try to convert them, but in the process, you actually, in some sense, express, if only to yourself, a willingness to change your mind because you're listening. On the millennials, I am a, a huge millennial fan. I am an unapologetic apologizer uh, <laughs> for the millennial generation because I think, and I, and I define very broadly sort of 18 to 35, uh, maybe even a little older, because when you look at this generation, um, they have done a lot more service than earlier uh, generations. Now, some people say, oh, well, they had to because high schools had rules or they did it to get into college. Well, sure, some of them did, but their service itself transforms them. And so they have this very, I, I think they get this liberty community thing better than the rest of us do on the whole, except for that greatest generation that is largely past, where on the one hand, they're incredibly entrepreneurial, all this crowd funding and crowd, uh, sort of thing. Um, but they also understand uh, public institutions. They care about public institutions. They have a strong sense of community. Uh, they form social networks. That's not an accident. Um, so I have, um, you know, a lot of hope, uh, a genuine hope in this uh, generation. I teach in college, and I am just 
genuinely impressed by the kids who come in class after class. Christina, I want to give you the last word before we open up the conversation more widely here. But one of the things that EJ just said there, I think is super important, this, this what Christopher Lash was describing as this true uh, approach to argumentation, which you imagine yourself in the shoes of the other side. We just, had, we just came from um, another panel, some of you might have been on, with Damien Wetzel and Melody Barnes about citizen artists uh, and about the role of the arts in, co in cultivating a capacity to be self-governing citizens, right? And key to that conversation, boiled down what EJ just said, is empathy, right? C cultivating a capacity for empathy, to imagine yourself in someone else's shoes, which Christina, I mean, the, the dreamers, the immigrant rights movement more broadly, ha has been one of the most successful uh, one of the most emotionally moving exercises in activating empathy that we've seen in modern politics in a long time. And, and I'm wondering for you, at, at just at the personal level, not even necessarily as orchestrator of, of all of this uh, you know, political action, at a personal level, how have you gone about trying to create that sense of empathy when you encounter people who come into the game in the conversation saying, you're an illegal, come into the conversation saying, you know, I have an, I have an idea, let's deport you, right? Um, how do you uh, actually create a bridge of empathy where uh, they may still want to uh, delay or defer forever that pathway to citizenship, but at least they'll be able to imagine what it's like to be uh, you? I think it's about my story. Um, and I think um, it comes a lot down to what you're getting out of these living room conversations, which is when you share your story, what's your passion, where you come from, what do you do, um, how are you contributing to your community, you realize that we have a lot of things in common and that my dreams are your dreams and that in so many ways I am you. I am you. And so when we get to that, I think it, it's really hard for someone and I, you know, I had many friends and colleagues in, in college who were Republican, identified themselves as Republican and they didn't know I was undocumented, I was closeted. So I, you know, I wasn't sharing, I was undocumented, and so I had many friends and we were running for student government. And when they found out that I was undocumented, I thought I was going to be rejected. And that was my personal struggle, coming out and feeling like people were going to reject me. And it didn't happen, because they had realized, getting to know me and my story, that I was like them. That I had dreams like them, that I wanted to pursue different things, go to college, graduate. Um, and that really it makes all the difference. Well, the power of your story is remarkable. And um, one of the things that I'd love to do now is open up this conversation. And, and if you have questions for uh, any of our panelists, uh, uh, we have a couple folks in either uh, aisle with microphones. Uh, but if you'd like to just share a reflection or a thought as well, if you can respect the, the, the short amount of time we have left, uh, we truly want to hear, uh, hear that as well. So um, any hands? Right here, sir. <clears throat> Hold on, if you can wait for a mic so everybody no, can I hear you. Talk we oh, won't, I, I think they want to. Folks won't hear you. <laughs> yeah, the... okay. um, 25 years ago, I was the chair of the AmeriCorps program in Houston. And we were able to raise more money than anybody else did in any other community. And Clinton wanted us to have, a, a, as his major thing, he wanted a million people to be in AmeriCorps. That was the number he talked about. Uh, Senator Grassley wanted to have zero people in the AmeriCorps. So let's compromise uh, at a half a million. <laughs> <laughs> the question came to, I actually was at a meeting in, in uh, D.C. in which there were two senators and three representatives and, uh, and people from two other communities who ran AmeriCorps in those cities. And... Um, we said, okay, you know, let's, let's go for the million. And they said, where are you going to get the money? And with, I'm going to shorten this discussion. That was pretty much the end of the, of the process. And Clinton wanted it really badly. He wanted it to be one of his things that we would remember him for. So how are we going to pay for a in those days, uh, we were only paying about $7,500 to each of what we called volunteers. Grassley didn't call them volunteers because they got $7,500. Well, this came up, uh, first of all, I, I think it's the right question. And, and if you look back on our session, I think it's the thing that still needs to be worked out. How much more public money are we willing to put into this? 
and how much private money can be raised to fill in the difference? And what would the sources of money be? Are there state and local uh, entities that would be willing to kick in? And uh, you know, on the other hand, compared to a lot of other things, uh, these are people doing uh, very good work for very little uh, money. But I just want to reflect on sort of the Grassley and Dick Army view at the time when AmeriCorps was first set up. The, um, uh, the term they always used was paid volunteers or paid volunteerism. And Dave Gergen asked General McChrystal a very interesting, intentionally leading question where he said, you know, the folks who served under you in Iraq, uh, they would probably not take kindly to being diminished as paid volunteers. And the notion being that uh, because you're giving people a stipend so they can actually live while they're doing the volunteering somehow makes them less volunteers. And what McChrystal said that was so important is I want these kids to come not just from Scarsdale, but from East LA. And if you want all Americans to serve, including Americans of, uh, whose families can't support them while they're serving their country, you've got to have some money uh, behind it. So, I think you need the will to try to create this, and will can create some willingness to pay for it, but it is going to be, at a time of budget crunches, uh, this is a real challenge. But let's, let's I think it. it's worth paying for for a variety of reasons, but we might agree on that, but there are a lot of other people who need to be persuaded of that. Let's get a couple more voices in here. Um, uh, over here, e Ibu Patel, and um, as he's getting the mic, I'll just, some of you may have heard, Ibu e e runs an organization called the Interfaith Youth Corps, uh, based in Chicago. Uh, who, whose name sort of describes its own work, but uh, he was one of the central figures, uh, along with EJ, in, um, in a conversation yesterday uh, about faith and pluralism and citizenship in the United States. You took my first two lines. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> uh, so I so talked about a number of fascinating themes on this, from the Arab Spring to rugged individualism to government. Uh, de Tocqueville famously said that one of the great geniuses of American society was civic institutions. Right now, everything from Little Leagues to PTAs to YMCAs I want you guys to reflect on the future of American civic institutions in light of a number of major trends, right? One, the number of unaffiliated millennials. Uh, historically, religious communities have been a major driver of civic institutions. Two is the rise of the internet. Uh, three is uh, the decline in trust of all institutions, period. Four is perhaps the sexiness of revolution versus trying to build something over 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Many other trends as well. My big question is, in 30 or 40 years, are we going to have the same kind of civic institutional structure in the United States that we do right now? Heather or Christina, do you want to first take first crack? It's a really good <clears throat> question. And I spend a lot of my time trying to convince people to vote. And I would add to that list the party affiliation. So they're no longer identifying Democrats or Republicans, but independently. And so you're, lo you're losing that infrastructure and that sense of community as well. Um, I think that they will reshape what it looks like. I think they are continuing to gather together and take collective action, but just through very different institutions. Right now, that is often online uh, and through these social networks that they're building. Um, and it's uh, connected not just locally, but also in other states across the country, and then, in fact, quite globally as well. Uh, I, I don't know what that will turn into, but it's an interesting question. And Christina, I wonder what you think. I mean, I think that what we have seen with the immigrant youth community, it's that if it's not there for us, we have to build it. Mm -hmm. And we have to create the spaces for us. You know, with, even within the immigrant advocacy community, there wasn't space for youth empowerment. And at some point, a group of us decided, we need to create space for young people to make our choices, to drive our agendas, to organize and create a, a difference and, and have an impact. And that's what we did with the United We Dream Network. Actually, what we're experiencing with immigrant youth in our constituency is that from 2008, we, we had seven affiliate organizations. We have 52 in 25 states today. So there is a real hunger to belong, to be part of a network. And I am not such a Debbie Downer about like Facebook and Twitter because those are the tools that are given us a sense of connection, even with young people in Egypt right, um, leading their social movement. So I think from my, from my perspective, I see millennials and, and dreamers in particular using social networking tools to our advantage and being able to be as innovative as to think that in the next five to 10 years, 
when we think of the possibility of immigration reform, and you're talking about 11 million people who are living in the shadows, what is the opportunity that young people have and that organizations have and the government institutions have to get those folks engaged? And that's where we see the opportunity to do that. Mark, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think I mean, what we're talking about largely, Ibu, is the role of what I would call intermediary organizations in society. And history shows us that the bigger and more powerful government gets, the less of those organizations we have, the less organized they are, and the less powerful they are. Because uh, necessary to the existence of those organizations is power. I mean, we're, really what we're talking about is the distribution of power throughout society. So the more intermediary organizations have power, the stronger they'll be. I mean, you see that in the Immigrants' Rights Network. It's, it's the feeling that they can actually accomplish something, that what they do makes a difference fundamentally in how we live. That's what makes these organizations strong. We can organize all the organizations we want, but if they're disempowered, mm -hmm. if they're simply structures for communication, then people won't participate in them. I'm going to ask Egypt. This one I'm about to want to go and sit in one of those living rooms with Mark. <laughs> he says something I just think is flatly wrong and disproved by our history, by the New Deal, the interaction between farmers and the Agriculture Department, the GI Bill, and the veterans organizations. But I, if I can just say quickly on Ibu's question, I think it's a great question. I think we'll always have enough sports leagues because we're a sports obsessed uh, country. And that, you know, and I'm, I spent a lot of time on sports fields uh, with my kids. One of the things we don't take into account enough uh, is how much our uh, civic infrastructure was built by the unpaid labor of women. Uh, and that we had a long period of time when women uh, were not given opportunities in the workforce the way they should be. Uh, and a long period of time also when wages were high enough that people could raise a family on one earner uh, for a while. Women decided, no, we want these same opportunities, which is legit. But we were leaning on them a lot more than we want to let on to ourselves. And we have to figure out in this new circumstance what to do. What I worry about is organizations that mix people across lines, you know, Mark and I coaching together, uh, the same team, whatever. Um, we, the big sort, that book you all know, we really even live apart from each other and we don't have enough of what Bob Putnam calls bridging social capital and we gotta work on that. I, I wanna, there are several women whose hands have been up here. Um, let, let, let's start right here and then we'll, we'll move to the back uh, of the side of the room. No, up front. Right, right up front here, yes, you. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I work for a nonprofit in education and we talk about kind of the populations that we serve and I've done different kinds of volunteer projects and positions throughout like the last five to 10 years. And I guess the thing that I'm wondering about is what about the ethics of service? We don't often talk about the ethical implications of particularly white middle class people going into low income minority communities and then saying, oh, I'm serving you and you deserve this service. And I think that's a really powerful message that we're sending to mostly our middle class and our youth saying that certain people are deserving of service and certain people are deserving to provide that service. And what is that, how does that play out in the rest of your citizenship and your identity as a, as a leader or potentially as a follower and your ability to imagine yourself as maybe someone who's going to be a change maker rather than a follower. And I think I would really like to see more discussion around the ethics of service. That's One a great sentence question. and then everybody else. Uh, I think the value of universal service, and I'm not talking about compulsory, but the idea that everybody should serve is it says that the lowest income kid in the country has as much to give as the highest income kid in the country. And that service isn't just about you know, better off kids going to help out less well off kids, even though that is a wonderful and good and decent uh, thing to do. Um, it's also about uh, low income kids who know a lot of stuff that the rich kids don't, um, serving the country in the ways they can. And so universal service says, we are all in this together, no matter how rich, how poor, how, what our color is, what our ethnic background is, what our original citizenship status was. And that's why I like the idea of making it universal. Um, uh, actually, let's uh, get another question in here, uh, into the mix here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. <clears throat> oh, no. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> A struggle for the mic. I'm, it's my daughter's. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to pay for it, I know. You have a very good daughter. <laughs> 
Uh, Shelley Porges, Washington, D.C. I'm the uh, National Finance Co-Chair for the Ready for Hillary PAC. So you've been at every meeting I've been to. You're doing a good job. <laughs> and thank you very much. I appreciate that coming from you. Um, and I want to highlight uh, one of the things we're doing and then ask you a question because you touched on money before. What we're trying to build is a grassroots PAC. You know, we know in the last election, PACs have had very bad reputations for quote unquote buying elections or attempts to buy elections from perhaps billionaires, et cetera, et cetera. What we're doing is really something very different and on June 30th when we have our first filing, you'll see what we have accomplished to date since April when we launched, the thousands and thousands of people who have chosen to step up and support it. But I want to ask you because money is an issue. I mean, we're now talking about national service. You pointed out, of course, even these national servants need to be paid at some point. Um, where does the money come from and how, what, is the, what should the role of PACs and other organizations that can support these important initiatives to break through to new, uh, to new levels? What, can you comment on that, please? So let's uh, hear from uh, Mark or, or Heather. You actually were just having a conversation before we went live about yeah. money and politics. And you know, um, <coughs> I, I, I agree with like, what you're doing with that PAC is phenomenal. And PACs are like any entity. They can be used for good or bad. They're like people. Some people do good and some people do bad. So the idea that somehow PACs are evil is just wrong. It just depends on how they're used, how they're structured. And it, it depends on your politics, right? I mean, if you're anti-Hillary in 2016, you probably don't like that PAC. And, and so I just see them as a, a vessel to be used. And it depends on the ideas and the ethics that you fill them with. I don't personally have a problem with money in politics. I mean, if you look at the last presidential cycle overall, probably seven billion roughly spent in the cycle. We as a nation spent more money on potato chips in the last presidential cycle than we did on presidential politics. So I want more money spent on politics. I want more messaging out there. I want more people heard. You're to be commended for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Heather? Uh, yeah, well, I, I do have a problem with money in politics and the role <laughs> that it plays right now, but the solution that I've been more interested in is engaging more and more people. Right now, we have 60% turning out in a presidential election nationally, right? We had 51% of voters under 30 vote in the 2008 and the 2012 election, and we heralded it as like the year of the youth vote, record turnout, totally remarkable. Only half of them voted. What would it look like if 60, 70, 80% of them turned out? I tell you that people will trump money any day of the week when it comes to making decisions, if that's the case. And in terms of the PAC, grassroots organizing, empowering people to get invested in the campaign through writing a check, I think is a powerful thing. I think it's how we'll start to invest people in political processes in our institutions once again. I am uh, to create big incentives for <coughs> small giving. I think yes. the answer to big money is going to be um, f matching funds or vouchers or tax credits, some combination of things that privilege the small giver. Uh, and uh, I don't think you'll ever flood out the big money, but to have small money be competitive uh, with big money. There's a, a proposal in the legislature in New York to have a five to one match. Uh, Mark and I could argue about how you fund it, but I think the idea of privileging small money uh, is the best answer we have now, given what Citizens United won't let us do uh, to answering the big money. Well, we could literally have this conversation all afternoon, and I just want to close as our time uh, comes to an end uh, with a simple charge, actually, to all of you. Uh, th this has been a great conversation. You all have asked great questions and put some great comments in there. But the question for all of us here is, what are we going to do? What is within the ambit of our power to do to revitalize citizenship in the United States? Right? And we've heard in the course of the last hour several different great overlapping conceptions of what it means to show up as a citizen, whether it's strictly in electoral politics and, and the workings of, uh, of government, whether it's uh, more at the level of service and community, uh, whether it's trying to mobilize money uh, in, in, in new ways, uh, and whether it's about trying to re uh, reinvigorate the way we teach uh, the, the very nature of citizenship and self-government democracy. No matter what your angle of entry is, everybody here has a way to engage here. And let me put it a different way. Everybody here has an obligation. We can't come out of a conversation like this and say, that was great, I'm gonna to go to the planetarium now, right? Um, what we have to do is think, what am I going to do? What am I gonna pledge literally to myself, if not to the person I came into this room with, to do to reinvigorate citizenship just a notch? It might be in my neighborhood, in my city, it might be in Houston, it might be uh, at a national level. Uh, and if a room like this can make that kind of commitment, 
uh, we will set forth the kind of civic social contagions uh, that everybody here has been talking about and embodies. So thank you so much for being part of this conversation and pass it on. Thank you.